This is Wally, and this is Wally's Roadmap to Success. Last time I tried to do this with him about three hour, and a half hours ago, he peed on my lap, but I think we've progressed past that. Um, so basically, I'm gonna go over some of the tips and things that we went over in the session, uh, as well as kind of uh, how I'd want to have guests come in, uh, in the future. I'm gonna go over that first so a uh, guest doesn't have to watch 20 minutes of video to get to it. So basically, what I'd like to have you do is arrange to have a male guest come over. Now, before you do this, you can set him up for success by exercising. It's maybe a, a good long game of 10 or 15 minutes worth of fetch. And then make sure he has at least 10 minutes to recover before the guest uh, arrives. When the guest arrives, they should not knock on your doorbell or, or uh, knock on the door or ring a doorbell. They should call or text you. Then what I'd like you to do is take him out on a short leash. Now, you guys have a retractable leash, which is fine in some situations. I'd like you to get like a four or six foot leash and have the martingale collar on him. So, and uh, basically lead him out there. Uh, you could do what we did. Originally, I left kind of a trail of treats. Um, he doesn't need to, because it really didn't seem to matter that much for him anyways. So basically what you want to do is walk to where the guest is and try to avoid embraces or things or kisses and hugs and stuff like that. Just walk. And then what you want to do is you want to walk with a human here, the dog here and the human here. So the dog kind of in, in the sandwich in, in the meat of the sandwich. And then basically start walking to, to walk around your block. Once you pass the corner, somewhere like there to the first house, without Wally realizing it, I want you to just very quietly give the leash to your other, uh, to your guest. And so the end, uh, and then just keep on walking. If Wally looks up, maybe till you get to the first house and then you stop and then Wally keeps going. And eventually you would probably stop earlier before the corner like we talked about off camera. So uh, once he turns around and sees you guys walking away, he's gonna probably freak out. So the idea is we'd like to have you just stop and the guest keeps on walking with him and Wally doesn't even realize it at first. And finally he looks and sees that you're out there, he turns around and you're like 20 paces back there. And then basically just kind of stand there, prefer not to have you walk away, you could do that, but the idea is just to have him walking with the guest. Now the guest is pretty much gonna let him go wherever he wants on the, on the leash, the guest should not try to pet him, talk to him, or even look at him. Just all we wanna do is walk around the block. Now what I did is I stopped in the corner over here, um, and when we got there, I stopped, and, uh, and when Wally came close, every time Wally came close, I kind of took the leash and I uh, did another loop around my palm, so eventually it was only about this much leash. Now you don't wanna pull him towards you, you wanna wait for him to do it on his own. Now this, and when I was on the walk, some parts he was barking and crying, other parts he stopped, um, and ideally what you'd like to do is when he stops or when he starts barking, you stop and we wait. And as soon as he stops barking, then we continue. Uh, but it depends on if he's going crazy, he probably might not stop. Uh, but eventually that's where we'd like to get him. So eventually what you do is you stop and you sit down in the corner or someplace where it's reasonable. And then you, uh, when he, every time he comes close to you, loop it around your palm until he, eventually it's only like about a foot. And then basically you're gonna kind of hold it. We're not gonna pull him, uh, but we're just gonna kind of keep him from moving around. And he was kind of jumping across my legs. Eventually he was kind of laying in between and he was making some contact. Don't pet him, don't tell him to be calm or do anything. All we want him to do is enjoy the experience with you around the block. And then also uh, to get used to being around a human who does not try to pet them, look at them, eye contact me a challenge. If I can do any of those things, we're just gonna relax. Now, um, we might set up a, we need to set up a follow-up session where if this stuff doesn't work in a month, where we do actually some other distractions to do some maybe some behavior adjustment training. But I'm hoping we, if we can arrange to have like two or three times a week a new male come by and he does this, he gets a walk together and then give the male the, a bunch of these treats. When he's sitting down, he can try to offer a treat if he's, if he's not crying. Now, once he's crying or if he won't take the treat, a lot of times that indicates that he has cortisol, which is a stress hormone in the blood, and that shuts down non-essential uh, items. Bodily functions like digestion. You don't need that if you're in fight or flight mode. So the idea is to wait for him to calm down. And it took me probably about sitting there for about 10 or 15 minutes before he stopped crying. And then once he stopped crying, he at that point was touching me, so I was able to put my hand on him. Now, if you pet him when he's crying or whimpering, you'll be amplifying that. But if he does get, uh, what I kind of did at first was I touched him with the back of my hand uh, like this when he just kind of bumped into me. And I got him some more incidental contact and eventually got to the point where I could lay my hand across his small of his back and he was okay with that. Uh, now, um, at that point, I asked him to sit. He sat, I gave him a treat. Um, actually, I didn't give him a treat. Um, I think he was too worked up. But what I did is I told him to sit. When he sit, sat, then I got up. 
Then he started whimpering, and we, so we just waited. As soon as he stopped whimpering and crying, we started walking forward. As soon as he starts whimpering, we stopped again. So stopping the whimpering uh, caused me to accelerate the process of going towards home. Crying and whimpering stopped the process of going towards home. This is kind of a little bit of counter conditioning. So it basically teaches a dog, this behavior gets you what you want. This behavior doesn't get you. Sorry. Yeah, it was coming. Sorry about that. Uh, and so uh, this is a form of operant conditioning. So the idea would be, uh, and when, when a guest comes in, um, coming up the steps, it was the same thing. Once we got to the, uh, to the driveway, every time that he would start whimpering and whining, I stopped. And then uh, when he stopped whimpering and whining, I told him to sit. And only once he sat, that's when I would continue walking back up. And it took, and when we got to right outside the door, we had to stop right outside the steps. Then after the first step, right at the door. Also, one thing I forgot to mention the guardians, but whoever's in front is the, in charge. So if you let him walk in front of you on a walk, he's probably gonna be more reactive. But the, in this point, we don't want him to go into the house before you or before the guest. Now, if you're just letting him out and he's not going, you're not going out with him, that's fine. So once we came inside, I kept the leash short and I sat across from the humans. And I kept the leash, uh, th at that point I took the leash and I wrapped it around my shoe, giving him about that much room. And again, we're not trying to pet him or talk to him or do anything like that. All we want to do is just say, you can be near this human and the human's not gonna do anything that the human thinks is good or that you think is bad. Uh, so no touch, no talk, no eye contact. And then eventually uh, what you want to do is get something like that has a good amount of smell to it. Because eventually he started sniffing at my bag. Sorry, I work with a bunch of dogs and so my bag smells like a bunch of other dogs so it had good hidden scent. So what you might do is if there's other, friend, other people in the neighborhood that have dogs, what you might wanna do is take like a washcloth and there's like it's like this, Fold it up so you only have one quarter and then wipe that quarter on one of your neighbor's dogs. Then fold it up a different way and go wipe it on your other, and preferably between their shoulder blades and their back. And then, so you do it so that you have a, like a cloth that smells like four or eight dogs, then put it in a Ziploc bag and zip it shut. So then when your guest comes over, you can pull that out and just kind of put that on the ground and the dog starts sniffing it. Sniffing is how dogs should encounter the world. So that was kind of, once he, uh, and what I was looking for is his, panting to uh, to lower. He was really high pitch, uh, high, you know, crying, but also his breathing was really high. I went and I kind of came down one gear, then came in a second gear, and that's when he starts sniffing. So a lot of times it's accompanied by a, the exhale is often an indicator. So the idea is once, uh, once he's kind of giving you one exhale, at least he's come down at least a little bit, then you go get the washcloth, put it down to the ground. Another thing you can do is some people uh, with bat training, a lot of times we use shredded cheese. Not ideal on your carpet, but if you shred some, put uh, some shredded cheese, not just in one clump, so he's got to really work for it. Now he's sniffing the ground, which is a calming, normal behavior. He's distracted a little bit. And then once his breathing kind of calmed down a little bit more, then I just took my foot off the leash and he started wandering around off le uh, dragging the leash. Now it's dangerous for a dog to drag the leash around su unsupervised, so make sure you watch him. But after that, he pretty much was calm and relaxed, and we, we were buddies. He had a couple of uh, setbacks where he forgot. He started whimpering and whining at me. But I think, again, I think we're two, dealing with two issues here. We're dealing with a dog that's kind of petulant and I don't want to say spoiled, but really didn't have a lot of structure. So he wasn't, didn't see his humans as authority figures. Then we also had a bad experience. And I think those things, two things got a little get conflated in some areas. And a lot of it was manifest by his crying, his cry, whimper, cry that just really sounds horrible. Um, and so maybe tell your neighbors when you see them, hey, you know, we our, our dog is is come up with a coping mechanism. He also demand whines and barks, and he sounds like he's being abused. I mean, people are watching me. I had a guy we come out of a golf cart, and he's like, I just want to make sure you're doing not do anything, and I wasn't doing it. I'm just holding him. I'm not restraining him, but keeping him from moving around too much. And he goes like, Yeah, I watched you. You just sat there, and that's the whole point. We're gonna always outlast the dog, and so it's a little bit of what we talked about in the video above this. Anytime you're doing these things. Every time you give in, you're going to make the dog protest even more. Many people train their dogs to do exactly the opposite of what they intend. So we spent a lot of time in the session talking about that. So um, after, I try to arrange like to have about three people. Make sure they're men that will listen to you. And if you're one of the men that they reached out to, please don't think you're going to help out by petting the dog or talking to the dog or doing any of those things. We want the dog to feel empowered. Um, and then once that's the case, then tell them if they want to reach to pet the dog, if this is the dog's nose, reach 90% of the way and stop here. If the dog turns its head or backs up or lowers its head, it's the dog's way of saying, I don't want you to touch me. And the more the people were attract and don't pet him, the more empowered he feels like he is. I go like this and they leave me alone. Yeah. 
well, that's maybe that's a healthy thing for him to do. And so I don't have to cry and whimper and over act all the rest of the stuff that I do. He probably deserves an Oscar. So I think part of it is he is putting on a bit of an act. Um, okay, so um, now if this stuff is still going on about after you've been do, trying to do two or three people a week for about a month, if it's still having a problem, then let me know. We can look into doing some behavior adjustment training, some click for looks. There's a lot of other activities and exercises we're gonna do. We're also gonna have him come to our puppy class. Um, and so our puppy class, we have socialization period. And so we're, the, I'm gonna have the guardians come and hang out during the socialization period because there will be other men in the room. It's a different environment, so it might not work because it's a different environment, but I'm guessing he probably is still gonna be a little bit nervous, but more interested in playing with the other dogs. So that helps him practice being in a room with men that he doesn't know that don't touch him or talk to him or you know, do anything. And the more, the more that he experiences that, the more confident he's gonna be. And eventually then he's gonna learn that other, other men are not a boogeyman. Matter of fact, there's something good. Now, one of the little things I didn't teach you here, but one of the things I'd uh, like you to do is teach him how to catch. And to each catch, to teach how to catch is really easy. Just have one of you sitting on the floor and facing him. One of you sitting on the floor next to him. We throw the tree. Oh my God, sorry. We, we, when we throw treats, we go one, two, and then we and then the dog starts looking. Then we throw on the third one and hit him on the head. So what you want to do is just one toss, toss at the first motion, and try to do, make such a good toss. All he has to do is open his mouth and it goes in there. If it doesn't, it's not going at first. It's going to hit his nose and hit the floor. Well, if he licks it up, then he's just going to do that. So instead, the person that's sitting next to him picks it up and off the floor and gives it back to the person. The only way I get it is by snatching it out of the air. This is a wonderful activity because then when you have guests come over, if he's still a little bit nervous, he can play catch with the guest and that allows him to have his whatever distance he needs to feel comfortable and also still have positive engagement with the guests. Okay, so uh, we also, uh, we talked about uh, exercise. He does good on exercise. His guardians do uh, well on exercise. They do a lot of fetch with him. I'd like to see maybe a little bit more walks. Remember when you're walking, think about the duration of the walk, not a circuit. So don't think I'm walking around the block. I'm just going to walk this direction for 17 minutes. And when I'm at the top, turn around, cross the street on the way back. And so that it's very sniffing and very energy draining and stimulating, as well as relaxing for dogs to sniff. So you take him on a walk where he gets to spend like 20, 10, 20, 30 minutes sniffing around. He's going to be much, he's going to be stimulated and also more relaxed. And it'll help. Like I said, before guests come over, set him up for success by having that uh, exercise burned off, uh, that excess energy. Okay, so um, other things you can do, uh, I would really like to see him get a snuffle mat. Now, make sure you take care of the feeding thing first. So he's eating the food out of his bowl when you give him permission. Right now, the guardians free feed him. Once you get to that point where you put the food down he's, and he eats whenever you say it, then you can go to a snuffle mat. And so uh, for, remember to use a, come up with a command word for him to eat. So every time you take for four months, he takes his first bite of food, call it chimichanga, or whatever the word is you want to use, that becomes his command word to eat. Once that's the case, then I'd like you to start varying, teach, uh, feeding him one or, two, one or two meals a day out of like an Omega treat ball. You can order those on Amazon or Chewy. Uh, I have one that's a star. The dog has to move trays in order to get the food underneath it. They have puzzles. Um, one of my, my lead trainer, Julie, loves a snuffle mat. And those are things you can make yourselves. You can order online. It looks like a floor mat with a bunch of tassels coming off. And you hide their food in it. He's got to use his nose to find it and then move the stuff around in order to lick it up. It's again, emulates that sniffing behavior, which is calming, um, and it makes him work for his food, which will be physically draining. So, uh, the Omega Treat Ball also have to nudge it just right to get my food. So the more that he starts to uh, have activities that are stimulating for him, but also can drain some of that excess energy and be really beneficial. Uh, now we also talked about um, uh, not allowing him, uh, some of the rules we talked about, which should be in place for at least 90 days or as long as the problem is still going on. At the end of that, remember, uh, breaking a rule to reward a dog is very confusing. So uh, for the first rule I usually see this is not allowing them on the furniture, because for dogs, the higher they sit, the more rank or social status that they have. Sitting at the same height as me says that we're peers, sitting up here says he has more authority than me. So I would not let him be up here or where the, basically where the camera is on the couch right now. Um, eventually he will get couch privileges when the humans decide to give him an invitation. It's a one-time pass, it's only for good behavior. If he starts barking or digging on the couch, then he gets ejected from the couch. Now by ejected, I mean you push him firmly to the edge of the couch so he feels like he's about to fall off and then he jumps off on his own. You can also teach an off command where he's on the couch, show him you have a treat and throw it on the ground when he jumps down and licks it up, say the word off. At that point, don't let him back on the furniture. 
I'd recommend getting the X mats uh, to keep them off of the furniture, especially when you're gone. Uh, just when you, just put them on the couch when you come to sit. Fold it up, put it underneath the couch. When you go to the bathroom, unfold it, put it here. Go to the bathroom, he comes up. Oh, oh darn! Placeholder. And so that helps him. Remember, it takes 90 days to form this behavior pattern. At <coughs> uh, the same time that we took away the furniture, I showed the guardians how to uh, teach him to go to the dog bed on command. The dog bed, uh, remember to get one on, uh, the one I like to get on for Groupon, get a Sealy Posturepedic or Memory Foam. It should be just all square with maybe three lips on, on the side as kind of a back, uh, but no pattern, light gray, white, or light cream uh, for the color. And just throw this treat. So the first one is I throw the treat let, and say the word uh, pitch when he licks it up. Um, do that about 10 treats, but he's got to have at least one paw on the, on the dog bed. And then the second way I do it is uh, leave one there when he's not paying attention and just observe when he licks it up, say pitch. Third way is I lead him onto it, put him in a sit or an LAY, and then give him the treat and say pitch. Um, these are three ways to entice him to go there. After a while, he should start going on his own. At that point, you should pull out a treat and throw it there. And the best place I like to put it is right underneath the, the TV. So that way, when we're watching TV, the dog's like, man, they didn't love me. But look at it, they're just watching me the whole time. Um, so at that point, one, anytime he goes there, we're going to say the, at minimum, say the word pitch. If we have a treat, we'll throw a treat, and then when he licks it up, say pitch. Or we can get up and go over and pet him and say pitch, but a lot of times when we get up, go to them, they get up and move around, they think we're going somewhere. So it's okay if you just say the word pitch. But it'd be nice to get to the point where you could just turn your head away from him and say pitch when he can't see your face. And if he goes there and lays down, or at least goes there, you know he has that command word. That is an exercise where I can show you when we, if we do need a follow-up session where I can show you how to prolong and help him practice going to his dog bed and zenning out and just relaxing. I'm hoping we won't need this, but if we do, and you've already taught him to go there, it makes it a lot easier. Um, okay, so that's uh, one of the first rules, not being on the furniture. At, that, at the end of that, it's with an invitation, but only for good behavior. Now, he sleeps in the, dog, uh, in the parent's bed, um, but he likes to sleep between them. So I would say that, uh, the guardians go get in bed first, and then when they're ready, they invite him up. If he tries to get down, uh, they said he's growled and nipped at them a little bit when they try to move him down. What you can do is just pick up the sheet. If the dog's here, just pick up the sheet, and it becomes like this wave if you have to. Or you could just teach him to go off the dog off the bed by throwing the treat off and saying the word off. Just don't let him go back on the bed. Now, to teach him to go to a specific part of the bed, what I would do is a similar principle what we did with the dog bed. Just go in there in the room with about 20 treats, maybe 10, 10 of these treats. I'm going to leave the bag here with you. Tear them in half and just throw it to the corner of the bed where you want her to go and come up with a different word for that place. Call it reservations or you call it holiday inn or whatever you want to come up with, some funny word. Um, and bridal suite. And so you just keep on throwing the treat there and he goes and licks it up and then lead him over there, put him in a sit or an LAY, give him the treat and say bridal suite or whatever the name is. Um, and then when, uh, the idea is you just kind of programming and creating that command word. If he wants to sleep in between you, that's kind of, he's trying to interfere with you guys and say, hey, I'm in the middle of all this. And that, you know, that's not really appropriate. And so we can share the bed with him, but this is the area we're going to share with you. And once we go to sleep, if he gets up and where he wants to be, that's fine as long as you guys are okay with it. But this is my bed. If I'm going to share my bed with you, this is the portion of my bed I've allocated to share with you. If you don't like it, Wally, there is a whole lot of floor for you, buddy. And uh, so, but uh, the growling and nipping at you guys, I think, is a part of an offshoot of not being practiced at listening to you or hearing you guys disagree with them. So, um, all right, so uh, the other rules that I would have, uh, that I would suggest, uh, he has to sit before we let him in or out of door, go to the door and say sit once. If he doesn't sit within three seconds, walk away, sit down, wait one minute, then go tell him again. If he barks or whines at you, just wait for him. Don't even start the timer. Um, and as soon as he stops barking and there's like a couple seconds, then you can get up and go there. Uh, but if he doesn't bark, then I would just wait one minute while I'm seated. After one minute, I go back to the door and command him, sit. One, two, three. It doesn't sit by three. I walk away and sit down for two minutes. Next time I sit down for four minutes and eight minutes and so on. Make sure you're seated somewhere nearby. And don't, and anytime that he's whimpering or whining for anything, you have to be willing to stop what you're doing and just nothing happens, become very boring until he stops giving that to you. Um, that you guys have probably kind of kicked the ball down the field a little bit, but now at this point we need to help him understand that's not, not only is that not going to get your way, it causes the human to become boring. After a while, He'll start doing other things once we start talking about petting with the purpose of past training, which we'll talk about in a minute. Now, I showed the guardians how to enforce an invisible boundary. Remember, you stop enforcing wherever the boundary line is using that third escalating consequence. So uh, uh, when you're cooking, he should not be allowed in the kitchen. When you're eating, he should not be found seven feet around you guys. 
Um, let me see, if you're going up and down the stairs, he shouldn't go up and down the stairs ahead of you. And an easy way to do that is if you're starting going down the stairs and he races ahead of you, just go to the stairs and take like one or two steps as you're just going into your kitchen. So he's like, oh, we're going downstairs. I'm going to I know the way, follow me. He runs all the way down there and you take two steps. As soon as he passes you, come back up and go back and then you're getting your bottle of water or whatever it is. He's like, oh, where, 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 where do they go? And he comes back up to us. What happened? Well, as soon as you take over the leadership role, I have no interest in following you. And so after a while, he'll learn to stay behind you as you go out the door or through, down the stairs or whatever the case may be. Um, and then for eating, make sure that you guys are eating something before you feed him and no more leaving the food down that's free feeding. So I'm gonna feed, I'm gonna eat something myself. What I like to do is I like to actually put the bowl down and he's not allowed to cross the line. Same one for the kitchen, I would imagine. And then basically you eat and lean against your counter over there where your toaster is, lean against it and eat some chip, cracker, whatever you want, something in five more bites. And then go over there when it's time and call his name, tap the bowl a couple times. And because he's free fed, I'm guessing his first couple days, he's like, whatever, I'm not even interested in eating. So I would only try to call him over for about a minute. If he doesn't come over within a minute, just pick up his bowl, dump it empty, but make, and make sure he sees you do it and put the empty bowl back down. It's important to put the empty bowl back down. The mistake people take is putting the whole bowl up. And then he looks at you taking his food. When you empty it, you're changing the state. And we're going back to basically how dogs are in the wild. If they don't have a successful hunt, they go to bed tired and hungry, and they don't have as much stamina the next day. That's why it's such an important activity for dogs. So basically, um, we're going to eat something first, our regular meal, or five bites or something is all it takes. Then we're going to go call him over. And if he doesn't come within a minute, then we pick it up and dump it. Or if he comes over, as soon as he dresses the bowl, he's on the clock. And as soon as he walks more than four paces away, I pick up that bowl, dump it empty, and put the empty bowl back down, and I don't feel guilty about it at all. I give him an opportunity, he's choosing not to. And I'm guessing he's gonna go one or two days without eating, testing your will. And remember, one of the dirty secrets of dog behavior, you have to always outlast your dog. You're not saying you can't eat, you're saying this is the parameter to eat. If you don't wanna eat, that's fine. That's on your tab, not on my tab. Um, also make sure you're not giving any more people food. If you do get like some steak and you want him to have some of the steak because you want to throw it away, what I do is I chop it up the fat and gristle into tiny little bits and I put it in my microwave and I leave it there overnight. Then the next day I put that in his bowl. So it doesn't smell like in conjunction with the food that I'm eating at the same time, doesn't see it coming from the plate or the table, and then the next it comes the next day. And so that's just a better way to go about that. Um, all right, we also talked about passive training and petting with a purpose, and these are going to be huge for him. So petting with a purpose is if he comes up and nudges you, right now he climbs on top of his humans to ask for attention, one of the reasons why we suggest no furniture. So, I, and with furniture, remember, you can always go down to his level. You guys are the VIPs in your house, or the club is your house. You guys can go to the VIP section up here on the furniture. He can't. He's stuck in general admission. You can always go down there like the celebrities I go to Hollywood and the celebrities come out from behind the mirror and they're like, hop down a little bit. And then people ask for autograph and they run back behind the mirror and they make fun of us while we're dancing. So the same sort of thing for him. And that way he sees a literal distinction between the two of you. So um, when he comes up and nudges you or barks or demands attention, we're going to give him a counter order to tell him to sit. If he's already sitting here, ask him to sit over here or ask him to lay down. If he does it within three seconds, we're going to pet him under his chin and say the word sit and only the word sit. Not good sit, not what a good boy, Wally, you sat down. They hear the first word we say. And also say it normally. Don't say sit. I say it twice during the command stage and during the reward stage. Sit to tell the dog what to do. When it sits, I pet under his chin and say the word sit to reinforce and put in context. I'm petting you for this action that you're doing right now. Um, so uh, if he's already sitting, ask him to lay down. So don't ask him to shake because he already has issues with his paws. So um, if he doesn't listen to you, show him that you got 23 other things going on. Pull out a magazine, turn the TV on, make out with your partner, whatever you want to do. But he needs to understand, man, oh, I'm, she wants me to sit and watch. If I don't sit, she's going to say sit 13 times. They're making out. They're not paying attention to me anymore. And then after a while, he starts realizing that if I don't do what they want, I'm not punished, I'm not corrected, I'm not chastised. Remember, good attention, bad attention, same thing. So we're just gonna ignore you completely. Now, if he does the demand barking, and I get back to petting with a purpose, but for demand barking, you have two choices. If he demand barks, I like the dog to be able to bark at the three times to let him know there's a salesman, house is on fire, or something like that. So if he comes up and barks three times, I'm cool. Fourth bark, either I'm gonna say, okay, I'm gonna sit here and outlast him, and I pretend like it doesn't hear, I don't hear it, and I just watch TV. Not even a look, I'm not gonna, uh, not any of those things are rewarding. 
So I'm just going to watch TV. And it might be an hour of him barking. Well, now you should also recognize what time is it and how long has it been since I exercised him. It's been a while. Maybe we need to exercise him a little bit. Um, so the, option one is to write it out and no inclination whatsoever. When he does finally stop, then tell him to sit or lay down or do some command, then pet him for doing that. Don't just pet him, say quiet, because then he's just thinking, he'll just bark again. The other option is after the third bark, bark number four comes, get up immediately and go somewhere and close the door behind you. That's the fourth quadrant of operant conditioning. It's called the negative punishment, which means to deduct something from the equation that the dog likes, in this case, your presence. We say, hey, pet me. He walked away. Maybe I shouldn't say that because that caused me to get exactly the opposite of what I'm trying to achieve. So um, that can, in concert with petting with a purpose. So petting with a purpose, he nudges you, nothing happens. Leaders tell, followers ask. So he tells you what to do, nothing happens, other than you give him a counter order to tell him to sit. If he does sit, you pet him under his chin, within three seconds, you, uh, he sits. Then you pet him under his chin, say the word sit, and then you pet him as much or as little as you want after that. He has to do something to change his state. Now, after a while, he's gonna realize I, if I go sit in front of them, that, that's when they pet me, and he'll start sitting in front of you to prepay for that attention. When he does, pet him under his chin, say the word sit, and pet him as much or as little as you want. If he doesn't, like I said, find something else to do. Um, even if you want to pet the dog, still tell him to sit. Even if he's not asking for attention, if he doesn't sit, show him, hey, it doesn't bother me not to pet you. I hate to say petting your dog is wrong, because it's not, but what your dog is doing when you pet is supremely important. So um, you tell him to do something, he does it, he gets reward. If he doesn't, nothing happens. And use the word paycheck, that means I suspect you may have forgotten to pet with a purpose. Even though the person did it right, they have to stop petting, say sit when he, or lay down, or whatever the word is. When he does sit, pet him on his chin, say sit. Actually, I asked him to sit. When he flushed the toilet, he get up, and I continue petting, David says slept, which it is. Um, I'm also going to talk about passive training, which is the other end of this, but it just reminds me, when you guys come home, if he's excited, pretend like he is invisible. Don't talk to him. Don't say calm down. Just wait for him to relax. As soon as he does, let's say the dog's here, as soon as he's relaxed, I recognize that. I reach for him to start petting. He'll start wiggling. Pull your arm back and go back to doing what you're doing. At first, if this is a dog, first I might reach this far, then this far, then this far, this far, this far. But aborting or stopping your interaction with him with precise timing in concert with when he does things you don't want is huge. So make sure you get in the habit of me. I was going to pet you, but you started barking, buddy. So now I'm watching the NFL. And after a while, he'll learn, but it talks about repetition, consistency, and good timing. So it's important you stop Johnny on the spot or start up Johnny on the spot. But if you come home and he's all excited, you pet him, you're petting in that unbalanced state of, behavior, uh, state of mind, and that's going to reinforce it. Um, also, when you come and go, don't make any big deals out of it. Don't say, hey, buddy, you're going to hang in there. We're going to be okay, Wally. We're going to be gone for a while, but you'd be a tough soldier. He's like just going to sleep the whole time. So when you make it, make a non-production when you come and go, we just we come, we leave, no, no fanfare. All right, passive training is the easiest way to train any dog. Passive training is waiting for the dog to organically offer you the behavior that you want without any influence. So uh, earlier, one of the first things he did when I let him off leash, he'd jump on the couch, he started licking his guardian's face. Now that could be an appeasement, it could also be apology, it could also be marking. Um, but if he does, like say, watch TV and he just comes and he's back a lot on the couch, he comes up and just gives you a couple of lists, kisses, say kisses. I say kisses, that means lick the human. If I say love, it means lick the human right here. So, and I assign that just by waiting. Every time you lick my nose, I would say love. And so now love means I go lick him there. So um, when you're feeding him, come up with a unique command word. Call it, you know, tacos or whatever you want. Every time for four months he takes his first bite of food, he hears with tacos, tacos becomes the command word. Every time he brings you a toy, I know he doesn't like a lot of toys, but if he brings you another toy, say the name of that toy, uh, name all your individual toys, and come up with funny names, call it Felipe, whatever it is, and then pet him a little bit. Um, the more, uh, every time he drinks water, come up with a word that means water, call it happy hour, merlot, or whatever you want to call for his name. Um, every time he comes to you, pet him and say come. Every time he lays down, pet him and say crash. I like saying crash or chill. Every time he sits, pet him and say sit. Pet him preferably under his chin. Now you can pet him anywhere you want, just avoid reaching over the head because that creates a down nose orientation. Um, so the more that you pet him for with a purpose or for passive training, then he's going to start to get that figured out. Sitting, coming, laying down, these are things that instantly get my human's attention. And now when I bark at them, it's like I'm dead to them or it causes them to leave. Two, two things that I'm not looking to achieve. So 
After a while, he'll start offering you the behaviors that you want because those are the things that get your attention, which is why I tell people, don't even pet your dog, even if not demanding attention, still make him earn it. Um, okay, I also went over the four escalating consequences. Um, actually, I went over, only went over three because you guys probably don't need the fourth. The fourth is really stepping on the leash. Uh, but because we're doing the with the flooding a little bit with uh, guests, I'd rather not do that because I'm worried that might get conflated. Uh, so, and message me if you forget what to do, what, uh, what those are. Um, also, when you're playing fetch, incorporate those rules. So make him bring the ball, make him drop it before you pick it up and throw it. And once he's consistently dropping it, then make him drop it and then sit before you even pick it up. And then after a while, and when you get done playing, start playing a little game of leave it at the end. So we play fetch for a reasonable amount of time. Then I'm going to sit on the floor and start dropping it, and you have to leave it. And gradually elongate the amount of time he has to leave it for longer and longer periods of time. And you can also just independent of it. If he's nice and relaxed and chilling out on the couch, what if you can go over and grab the uh, grab it and put it right here on the floor, and he looks at it, leave it. And so what we're doing is rewarding him for leaving it alone and then gradually increasing the duration of how long we'd like him to leave it for. And when you get done with the exercise, make sure you pick it up. I mean, you got something wrong with him having it, but the idea is to teach him just because the ball is out doesn't mean I get it. I have to wait for my humans to give me permission for it, and then I have to sit or I have to lay down. There are all these rules that are with, with, uh, with the fetch now. But again, the more rules that he has, the more comfortable and confident he's going to be in your leadership because you're showing him through your actions by enforcing these rules. Remember, enforcing a rule is not being mean, and uh, rewarding him by letting him break a rule is, is a confusing way of uh, rewarding him. So it's better to reward him for, you know, if he gets up on the couch, you tell him to get down uh, instead of, you know, saying come back on the couch because you did it. No, I might tell you to, uh, you know, sit and pet you for sitting. Or, uh, you know, give him a stopgap, something else that you can pet him or reward him for doing. Or, you know, throw a couple of treats on the dog bed or play a training game or an exercise. So come up with some, some positive things for him to do uh, as opposed to just fetch is the only thing. Um, I'm trying to think, is there anything else we want to cover? I'm pretty good at summarizing these things. I've done it before. All right. Um, can, I, can you bring it back to me? There we go. This is Wally. Yes, big Wally. And this is Wally's roadmap to success. Remember, everything you do trains your dog. Only sometimes you mean it.